Now that we understand how the appetite regulation circuitry uh, more or less works in the hypothalamus, I want to start talking about some of the signals that feed into that circuitry, either promoting hunger slash appetite or uh, satiety. Okay, And the one we know the, that we've talked a lot about up until this point is leptin. We learned about um, mice that are deficient in leptin and why they become uh, so obese. It's because leptin secretion increases when fat stores increase in size and that is associated with more leptin signaling to the hypothalamus and leptin as we know is a satiety factor which helps us decrease appetite which ideally helps us shrink our fat stores. The converse is also true. When our fat stores are smaller, less leptin is released and hunger and energy expenditure hunger is promoted and energy expenditure decreases. What's interesting and kind of the main thing I wanted you guys to take from this slide is that leptin really has kind of this effective range of, of effectiveness. And most people who have good leptin sensing you know, they're going to respond to leptin levels increasing. However, in the obese state, um, leptin is sufficient, and in fact, we actually have high circulating levels of leptin, but the response is muted because of, um, we don't exactly know the mechanism of it, but resistance um, via the leptin receptor. Okay, so we've explored this quite a bit. So to bring in that leptin uh, information back into the hypothalamic circuitry, when leptin levels are high, that has a, a stimulatory effect on those palm C neurons, those pro-opiomelanocortin neurons that release that alpha MSH product which binds to its MC4R uh, receptor on that second neuron, that uh, paraventricular hypothalamic neuron, which we often call the satiety neuron as well. So that is going to promote a cessation in the desire to eat or satiety. What's cool about leptin is it also has um, an inhibitory effect on that pro-appetite pathway, the, the AGRP neuropeptide Y pathway. Okay, so if we're inhibiting that appetite pathway, uh, we have an inhibition of inhibition. So what's actually happening is we're, we're actually seeing uh, appetite go down and satiety go up. So that is the basic way that leptin feeds into that hypothalamic circuit. And we saw that here too. This is just kind of represented a little bit differently. Leptin has a stimulatory effect by binding to its LEPR receptors on those dual uh, palm C cart neurons in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. And remember those release that those palm C neurons release alpha MSH, which, which binds to its receptor on that that satiety neuron center. There's many of those satiety neurons in the paraventricular uh, nucleus of the hypothalamus. Another big message to the hypothalamic circuitry here is uh, the hormone ghrelin, which is secreted. It says the proximal GIT. Specifically, it's mostly secreted by the stomach. Okay, ghrelin does not act directly to our knowledge on those palm C cart neurons. Uh, instead, it acts via uh, stimulation of those, those NPY AGRP pro appetite eat pathway uh, neurons. So as you can probably guess, ghrelin is a uh, appetite hormone. In fact, we call it the hunger hormone. Leptin is called the satiety hormone. Ghrelin is called the hunger hormone. Okay. So here it just kind of shows you the same idea, but, but it starts to bring in a new concept, which I wanted to go over. Okay. So like we mentioned, ghrelin is secreted by those proximal um, gastrointestinal cells, specifically mostly in the stomach, and it has an endocrine effect by acting on primarily those uh, AGRP NPY neurons in the, the arcuate nucleus of the, the hypothalamus. Okay. However, I also wanted to bring in the fact that ghrelin has this um, this other effect by modulating other GI peptides that also interact with the hypothalamus, but through vagal afferents. So 
the the ghrelin pathway isn't mainly through vagal afferents, but I wanted to bring that in because it's going to start coming up more and more as we look at some other GI peptides that have both an endocrine uh, function, uh, getting they basically get to the brain through being in the blood and traveling through the blood to the brain, um, but there's also vagal afferent messaging to the brain as well through these GI peptides, and ghrelin can can perhaps modulate that. Okay, so we'll get back to that. So ghrelin, like I mentioned, the hunger hormone. <laughs> uh, I like to think ghrelin gremlin. It's like a gremlin makes you eat uh, a lot. Like I mentioned, it is secreted by the um, enteroendocrine cells of the stomach. Um, but we really haven't fully figured out what is the exact um, reason why ghrelin is secreted and what the exact stimulus is for ghrelin secretion and exactly its full mechanism of action, how it works, and how we might exactly use this knowledge that is still uh, up for the debate. What we do know, kind of one of the big seminal papers that showed us that ghrelin does have, or suggested that ghrelin does have some role in appetite, is that ghrelin levels tend to spike right before uh, meals. So here we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Ghrelin level seems to be highest, and when ghrelin levels seem to be the highest, people tend to well, want to eat, okay? And yeah, if we administer exogenous ghrelin, we do see uh, that, that individuals feel hungrier and they tend to eat a lot more, okay? Um, and like I mentioned, what's interesting to note is we're still trying to figure out all the functions of ghrelin. Um, we do know that it has receptors in the brain, but it actually has receptors all through the brain, and it also has receptor sites all around the body as well. It has many different roles, um, and again, we're still trying to figure all of those out and how it all kind of works together. Um, some notes that are important to mention is that in, in individuals with obesity, ghrelin levels seem to be higher and to remain higher following um, for a longer period of time following a meal, which might be one of the reasons why an individual with obesity actually eats more because their hunger levels are higher um, or the satiety factors aren't working. So they might eat more because they feel less full after that meal. Okay, and what sucks <laughs> is that we actually see that when individuals with obesity lose weight, uh, lose fat mass, ghrelin levels actually tend to go up, which is one of the reasons perhaps why um, it is so hard to keep that weight off because um, satiety signaling is compromised and appetite levels remain high or higher, okay? Um, that said, and we're going to explore this later in this class as well, we do see changes in ghrelin. We see decreases in ghrelin when individuals have certain forms of um, gastric uh, surgery. Uh, in particular, sleeve gastrectomy is associated with lower levels of, of ghrelin. And probably the only thing on here that could maybe help with actually count working with people with obesity or who are trying to lose weight uh, in like a non-medical setting is to know that ghrelin levels tend to be higher with um, sleep restriction. So one of the things you could talk to your future or current clients with is about the importance of sleep because we, when we don't get enough sleep that might cause our appetite to be higher during the day. Okay. And like I said, ghrelin has a lot of roles beyond its orexigenic appetite stimulating effects. It has effects on the pancreas, on um, white adipose tissue and brown adipose tissue as well. So there's lots of roles of ghrelin and we're still trying to kind of figure out how it fits into the whole picture. But never forget about complexity and how many other things are going on. Ghrelin doesn't work in isolation as does nothing else in the body as well. Okay, so like I mentioned, we have these this signaling to the hypothalamus via uh, endocrine signals, so uh, factors that travel through the blood and reach uh, pass through the blood brain barrier and reach the hypothalamus through the cerebral circulation. But also, certain peptides, especially ones associated with the digestive tract have that endocrine function, but also have a feedback function via the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10, the afferent vagus nerve. Remember, the vagus nerve has um, mixed functions from anatomy, if you've taken anatomy already, okay? So 
the the pathway back to the hypothalamus actually goes through something called the nucleus trax uh, solitaris which then communicates with the hypothalamus and other brain regions like the amygdala as well and um, and i'll represent that co concept again in a slide that's coming up I'm going to start looking at some of these GI peptides. In particular, I'm going to be looking at CCK and GLP-1, which both have that endocrine signaling to the hypothalamus, but also eventually re reach the hypothalamus through their, um, their ability to stimulate uh, vagal afferent uh, messaging. So you'll notice that CCK and G GLP-1 which are on here, which are both secreted by the digestive tract, digestive tract, they both have an inhibitory effect on that AGRP eat pathway. Okay, so they are both considered satiety um, peptides. Okay, so here I have CCK, and CCK starts to kind of uh, put these concepts together a little bit more. So CCK is secreted by uh, enteroendocrine cells, uh, in particular duodenal cells secrete CCK, and they secrete CCK primarily in response to food entering the small intestine. Okay, so it kind of, it's a big signaling, you've probably learned about it in your other physiology classes, but it's a big signaling molecule that basically starts telling the rest of the body what's going on in the digestive tract. Okay, so food enters the small intestine, CCK signals uh, the gallbladder, for instance, it signals the pancreas to tell it to secrete things into the duodenum so we can start digesting them. In addition to those signals, CCK also travels through the blood and passes the blood-brain barrier to act on um, the hypothalamus, that arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus where we have that appetite uh, circuitry. Okay, But like I said, there is also its effect on vagal afferents, which work through the nucleo, nucleus tract sol solitaris pathway up to the hypothalamus. And what's interesting as well, and this is kind of a side note, but leptin and insulin, which also have uh, direct endocrine effects on the hypothalamus, they're also able to actually enhance CCK's satiating effect um, at different levels of that, um, that that, um, afferent pathway. So CCK, like you said, you've probably learned about this before, well-established um, digestive regulating, digestion regulating hormone, but it's also a well-established satiation factor. Makes us want to stop eating when we've started eating because basically, hey, there's food here, I don't need any more food. That's basically the signal it's selling. Okay, so we can technically administer CCK exogenously to individuals, and when we do that, we do see that at higher levels of CCK uh, doses, energy intake um, tends to go down, especially the, the much higher, these, this, this isn't significant, but at higher doses of CCK, we do see uh, a decrease in energy intake and feeding behavior. Um, that said, I was like, so why isn't this like a pharmaceutical option? Um, the studies I've seen is typically administered um, uh, intravenously, so that's not really uh, practical <laughs> for one thing. It also tends to um, increase anxiety uh, in patients, so its side effects are probably part of the reason why it's not like a pharmacolo pharmacological option. Okay. Um, so I've already kind of said a lot of the things here. CCK is released by upper SI cells, particularly the duodenal cells. They work via vagal afferents, and it also is able to work um, more in that endocrine fashion, um, but this pathway is weaker. So its main um, mechanism of signaling is via those vagal afferents. Okay. Um, when we block CCK, so the, another reason we know that it is a satiating factor is that when we block it, it delays time to end of eating, which means that people eat for longer and they tend to eat more. Okay, so it's like I said, a well-established um, satiety factor. And they actually think um, that uh, increases in CCK are part of the reason why we often see that appetite decreases with age. Um, something they call um, um, anorexia of aging, where you know you might notice that your grandparents they eat a lot less. It might have to do. There's studies to support that it might have to do with higher levels of CCK in these individuals. 
Okay, I already went over that one. So we've done CCK. Okay, we know that it inhibits the pro-appetite pathway. We've talked about ghrelin, which is secreted by our stomach cells, uh, primarily uh, in this case, that works via promotion of the MPY, AGRP, um, appetite-stimulating pathway. We've learned about leptin, which has both a stimulatory effect on the satiety pathway and an inhibitory effect on the NPY, AGRP pathway. We're not going to talk too much about insulin, but it basically does the same as leptin in this um, in the circuitry. And the last one that we are going to cover as far as these go is uh, GLP-1. Okay, uh, and GLP-1 is secreted by intestinal cells, kind of like CCK. It's secreted by intestinal cells in response to food intake. So it's again that message back to the brain saying, "Hey, we have food here now. You can stop eating." It's that satiation factor. Okay. That said, we've noticed a lot of um, impaired GLP-1 signaling in individuals with obesity. Another reason why appetite seems to be higher in individuals with obesity. And again, we're just talking about kind of endocrine, more biological factors. Whereas we've also talked about the genetic reasons why individuals with obesity have impaired signaling too. So. I think this is really important just to kind of take a step back here and realize again why it's important to understand that each individual is different and that it's just harder for some people. And it's harder for some people for real reasons we don't fully recognize, like we don't fully understand the whole mechanism, but kind of at the basis, it's like they just have more appetite, they're just hungrier. And also when our body changes and we learn to receive more food and we get larger, the body wants to keep that going as well, which makes it really hard for some individuals with obesity to lose weight because they feel hungry all the time. And it's not just so much that they can tell their thinking brain, hey, eat less. You know, their their prefrontal cortex can be involved with that, but there's all these other signals that that part is uh, competing with. And that's why we don't, <laughs> I don't recommend willpower <laughs> as a sole way of, you know, do, like helping people with o obesity. Okay, a little tangent there. <laughs> um, so what GLP-1 uh, does, sort of take a step back here, what GLP-1 does, again, it works directly on the hypothalamus, but it also works through uh, vagal afferents to, uh, through the, the NTS and towards the, the hypothalamus, again, to promote satiety. It also tends to delay gastric emptying and that actually, um, the longer the stomach stays full, um, that typically uh, promotes more feeling of fullness as well. Okay, stomach stretch is another thing that promotes a feeling of fullness. So if we have a delay in gastric emptying, that also helps to reduce appetite. Okay, so an interesting um, side note here, and we'll get back to this when we get to the pharmacological interventions for obesity, is um, what is known as Saxenda, which is liraglutide. I always say it wrong. I think I said it right there. <laughs> but it's commercially available as Saxenda, and it's actually a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And um, it is one of the most popular um, uh, obesity and approved obesity drugs here in Canada and its main mechanism of action is an appetite suppressant but it's not cheap and it's not covered by I know it's not covered by BC healthcare but I don't know if it's covered by in any other provinces um, and extended medical often doesn't cover it either so it's uh, which kind of brings into the socioeconomic um, considerations with obesity as well that the people that you know, might be best able or best financially able to deal with their appetite changes are the ones that have uh, more money and uh, the others might be more disadvantaged. So we'll get back to that later. <laughs> so remember, and I kind of uh, hinted at this as well, as we're talking about appetite and all this signaling, remember that this signaling can be compromised in individuals with obesity, as can like the reception and the circuitry in the hypothalamus for genetic reasons as well. We know that mutations in the OBOB gene 
the one that's expressed in white adipocytes, um, that's going to have no leptin secretion and obviously affects satiety, although that is very, very, very rare. Um, uh, uh, mutations of the leptin receptor, we also know that that promotes obesity and uh, diabetes as well. POMC mutations are also associated with obesity. That makes sense since that is the, um, the satiety sensation um, neuron, <laughs> one of the main ones. And um, like I mentioned, one the the most common um, mutation that's associated with obesity is this MC4R mutation. That mutation in the receptor on that second neuron, the one in the paraventricular uh, nucleus, that um, that is part of that satiety pathway. Okay. So putting this all together, like we said, there are a bunch of satiety signals from the digestive tract, including CCK and GLP-1 and peptide YY as well, which we're not going to really cover. There's also satiety signals from adipose tissue as adipose tissue increases in size. The pancreas also secretes insulin, which is another satiety factor, and these work either directly on the hypothalamus, or they can sometimes work through their vagal um, afferent sensing pathway as well. Conversely, ghrelin is the pro-eat one. All of those ones here, these are the satiety factors, and whereas ghrelin is more of that hunger or appetite factor, okay? Here is another representation of the same kind of idea, but what it does actually is it kind of shows you where that NTS is. Uh, it's located more in the brainstem. And remember, for instance, something like CCK, its main mechanism of action is through that vagal pathway, through the NTS, and then to the hypothalamus. Okay? So um, just again, to kind of putting all these concepts together. Okay? That said, I love the slide. Okay, if the hypothalamus is there to regulate feeding, and it's all supposed to be homeostatic, and it's supposed to regulate feeding, so when we're full, we get signals back to our hypothalamus. When our fat cells get larger, we get messages back to the hypothalamus. If that's all meant to be in balance, why is it not? <laughs> why are we eating so damn much? And we've already covered some of those reasons, and some of those reasons include impaired signaling or genetic changes as well. But one other major area or reason, excuse me, why we eat so much is that there's all those internal signals that are ideally providing proper feedback, but there's also all these other signals that, the, um, that are competing, <laughs> like what we see and our association with the foods we see the memories of the foods we see, the reward we remember about the food we see, right? Our emotional centers also speak to the hypothalamus as well, which is one of the reasons why certain individuals, when they're going through uh, emotional states, they might be more likely to overeat, okay? So we have like this homeostatic appetite, but really it's this what we call hedonic, hedonistic feeding or hedonic appetite, which is often overriding this homeostatic uh, system, which is probably, the, for me, the more interesting part of appetite, okay? And remember, <laughs> we're just scratching the surface of this. We don't have time. We could do a whole freaking course on appetite. I wish we could, actually. I love appetite. Um, but this slide is just to, to get you to remember about the complexity of this whole system. We've really only kind of focused on circulating signals and how those speak to the hypothalamus. Okay, but in the next um, unit, we're going to start looking a little bit more at reward. Learning has an impact on our appetite, as do um, as do our habits as well, and external sig um, stimuli can stimulate our reward pathway, can stimulate our, can affect our learning, and um, can be coded into our memory, and all of these things, all these competing factors that are competing for, you know, who wins? Do we eat or do we not eat? There's so much competing there, and that's why I firmly believe that when we're working with people, that it's important to figure out, like, what signals are winning these days? What signals are overriding it for the person? Is it emotional eating? Is it that um, 
they're eating the wrong types of foods that are not helping good signaling uh, patterns. Okay, so for instance, processed foods can really mess with the signaling patterns of, um, of those digestive secretions. So these are kind of things we want to look at to really understand if we really want to help people move past their some of their eating, overeating issues, we might want to look at some of the other reasons that are affecting affecting appetite. And it's not just a lack of willpower. Please do not think that there's so much complexity going on here.